building. Construction handling. We're gonna talk about leases at 11. Um, so just real quick recap on leases, how we get paid since this is here before I erase it. Um, how do we get paid on leases? You get paid on the term of the lease. So if you sign a one-year lease at 5,000 a month, that's 5,000 times 12 months, the value of the lease is 60,000. So if the commission is 6%, and then that 6% can get split listing broker, buyer broker, right? But this is how we calculate commissions. So 12 month lease at 5,000 a month is 60,000 for the year times 6%. The total commission is 3,600. If there's another broker involved, it's gonna be 1,800 per broker. And then instead of the tenant, making one check for 10,000 to the landlord. So usually the tenant would make a check security and first month, first month plus security. There, people say first, last and security, there's no last, we don't get last. We get first and security. Okay, so first and security would be 10,000 if you're getting one month security. So, so the landlord thinks they're gonna get one check for 10,000, but that's not how it works. We subtract our commissions. We tell the tenant up front instead of making one check to the landlord for 10,000, Make three checks, one check to Keller Williams for 1800, one check to the other broker for 1800, and the balance of 6400 you'll make payable to the landlord. So that's how we get paid. If we did not get paid like this, we would ha we would have a collections department. Every broker would have a collections department full time. The checks in the mail, the checks in the mail, the checks in the mail. The landlord would never pay. But there's no such thing as an honest landlord. Uh, no, there's a, they're honest, but they don't pay bills on time, right? In joke, right? So you know, people don't pay bills. Uh, so that's that's how we always get paid. All right. So today, objection, objection, your honor, objection, handling. All right. So this is a scripts and dialogues class, and the, in my shared folder that I share with you guys, um, if you don't have access to my shared folder, just email me, kj. All the at TW, and I will give you access. JJ Wallach at KW. Um, just send me an email, shared folder. Um, everything. This whole business is about scripts and dialogues. So, when you talk to a coach. Right, a coach. A coach is all about how do I increase my business. Like I'm here to help you know the contracts, how to be a good agent, how to what's the process of taking uh, a deal from listing it to selling it. The whole that whole process, or a buyer from making an offer, inspecting the property to closing. So I'm I I will train you that whole process. But a coach is someone who's going to look at your business as a whole and say how do we grow your business? How do you get more sales? How do you list more property? And what's going to happen is you're going to tell your coach how much money you want to make, right? Your coach is going to say, how much money do you want to make? And then the coach is going to say, okay, um, this is the average price per sale in your area. Um, this is how many homes you need to sell in order to certain comes, right? So now in order to sell that many homes, you need to have X amount of listings. Because if you take 10 listings, maybe eight will sell, right? Maybe it's all 10 will sell. I mean, but in a perfect world, 10 would sell. But let's say you take 10 listings and eight would sell. So, so you're figuring backwards. You need to take eight listings. Um, how many appointments do you need to go on to get eight listings? So maybe you need to go on 12 appointments to get eight listings. Um, Okay, so if you need to go on 12 appointments, that's only one a month. Okay, so then the question is, how many how many people do you need to talk to to get one appointment? Okay, If we were in like mid-America, we'd be talking, you have to do 100 sales a year, right? I mean, I was just pulling, um, I was just pulling comps yesterday, not comps, but I was looking up Keller Williams agents, I'm trying to remember what area, uh, somewhere back east i don't know their average sale is like one hundred thirty thousand dollars, right i mean we're so spoiled here on our commissions right if, if we sell a one and a half million dollar house by the way the, the average commissions here in beverly hills are i mean the average sale is 10.7 million right now 
So in March, there were there were seven sales, single family um, in Beverly Hills. The, the lowest was 3 million. The next lowest was 5 million. The next was 7 million. So that's where we are. This is our inventory. Um, if you sell one and a half million dollar property at two and a half percent commission, that's a thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollar commission. One, one sale. If you get the if you have, if you have a listing, you get the buyer also. That's seventy-five thousand. And that's a one and a half. That's like a condo around here, right? Um, all right. So meeting with your coach. Your coach is going to say how much do you want to make. Um, this is how many sales you need to have. This is how many listings you need to take to get that many sales. Uh, this is how many appointments need to go on to get that many listings. This is how many conversations you need to have to get an appointment. So we're keeping track of those numbers. What's going to make your ratio improve? Less appointments to signed listing, right? Uh, selling almost every listing you get, right? What's going to happen on that? What's going to improve those ratios are your scripts and dialogues. So we as agents need to always be practicing objection handling and scripts and dialogues. So what do you guys think would be objection? Where, where would objections come from? When you're doing a cold call. Okay, when you're doing a cold call, great. So calling. And what kind of cold calling would you be making? For sale by owner, right? Maybe Maybe default, people in default. This is a great one. People that we're, we're always saying, like, who do I, who should, how do, who should I be calling? Right. So people that are in default need to sell. So no matter what interest rates you're doing, there's going to be an interest rate conversation. So that's, that's something that we're going to have to talk about interest rates. That's an objection to people. I don't want to sell because then I, I have a 3% interest rate and then I'm going to have a 7% interest rate. Right. So that's, that's a interest rates or an objection. Any other objections? You guys, there's lots of it. Who's asking for discount points? Oh, man, discount. Will you do it for less? Discount commission. Listing price of the home? It's listing price. Let's, let's, let's list higher and leave room for negotiation, right? Okay, list high. List high, yeah. list high yeah. sell low. That's a bad strategy. It's a bad strategy. Okay, well, we're gonna so we're gonna talk about these objections. So, our our job is to just get better and better and better at at objection handling. And as a, as a new agent, when I was coaching, I would think to myself, "Why is this coach coaching when he could be out there listing all these properties? He knows exactly what to say. He could score like every listing. Why is he coaching?" I would <laughs> ask myself that. You know, and here I am, like right teaching, helping. I, I really enjoy this. I could never understand like why why coaches would do this instead of listing property themselves, but I, I get it. I, I really enjoy it. I love I love the action. I love helping agents in their deals. It's it's, it's for me it's a, it's a high to to do deals. Like for you, it is too, right? Um okay. So what other objections? Anything come to mind? Door knocking. Door knocking. So they're they're gonna take me out of this house in a box, right? <laughs> they're gonna what? They're gonna take me out of this house in a box. I'm never leaving. Or not. All right. So all right. So let's let's talk about some of these objections. So cold calling. All right. I don't I don't call cold calling. Excuse me. I don't call cold calling cold. I don't I don't I don't look at it as a cold call. Whenever I'm gonna call someone, there's a reason I'm calling. So What's what's the reason I'm calling? So, um, as an as an agent, now if you guys drive through areas, um, you'll see sometimes in some areas you'll see one agent has a lot of listings in one area, right? So that's their geographic farm. Um, you as an agent might want to have a geographic farm. Like that could be your thing. I I can tell you every agent that I know that has committed to door knocking and having a geographic farm is very successful they committed to it and they're they are very successful they committed to it. basically that's it um i have a very large database in my phone so i i call myself a head knocker like if i just go through everyone in my database and call them 
I have a lot of contacts, a lot of high wealth contacts. So I don't need personally to have a geographic farm. I'm just calling everybody I know. And most of your business is going to come from people that you know, maybe not them personally doing deals, but referrals. Because everybody will come across two people every year that are looking to buy or sell something. So you want to ask for referrals all the time. Um, and we talk about social media stuff, posting social media. Keep your social media posts 80% personal and 20% business. Because if you're 100% business and all your posts, people are just going to ignore you. Right? So 80% personal is a good ratio. Now, when I say that, these, I'm saying that because this is tested. This is Gary Keller saying it. You know, Gary Keller is analyzing agents that are doing this successfully. I'm not making these numbers up. All right, so cold calling. I have a reason when I'm calling. So if I'm going to take over an area, let's say that's my thing, geographic areas, um, and I'm going to start calling people in that area, when I'm calling, now you're going to have a few seconds before the hang-up on you, right? So um, I'm going to find a house that recently sold right around them. And I'm going to call and I'm say, hi, this is JJ Waller, Keller Williams, Beverly Hills. Real quick, a house around the corner from you at such and such address just sold for this amount of money. Would you be a seller around that price? And I got what I got out exactly what I'm saying, finding out, you know, would you be a seller around that price? Um, so right away, they could laugh. They could say no thank you and hang up. They might engage me in conversation, right? So I'm going to have a follow-up question. Um, if They might say, do you think I could get that? Or I think my house is better. You know, whatever they say, I'm just going to say, can I come see your house? That's, that's my I just want to get in there. If they give me any opportunity for an appointment, it's can I come see your house? And then I'm just going to make the appointment. And then I'm going to go to my computer and start preparing my list of presentation. Doing comps, listing presentation. Okay. Uh, why else would I be cold calling? Um, if you're cold calling people that are in default, uh, people that are late on their mortgage payments. So let's put ourselves in this people's frame of mind. Frame of mind. Their phone is ringing with bill collectors. They're probably not answering. Right? You're going to have to go maybe door knock these people. Um, if you get them on the phone, the 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 instant. The, the the dialogue you're going to have with people that are late on their payments is um, I can buy you time in your house and get you and get you the most money possible out of your house. So if your house goes to auction, you're probably going to get 80 to 85 percent of its value. If it goes to auction, I can I can stop the auction and and get you 100 percent of the value. Right. So and buy you some time. So that's that's what's valuable to someone who's late on their payments. Um, if that, you know, basically just get in the door, bring the comps. It's, a, it's an immediate listing, right? They have to get their property on the market. You're going to contact the trustee and just tell them, uh, please give us an opportunity to get the property on the market. And they will. Like everyone's operating in good faith. Uh, user, most lenders usually do not want to foreclose. They, they will let the seller try to sell the property. Um, all right. For sale by owners. Wow. This is something you guys should really. Um, I, so in my shared folder, I have a folder called scripts and dialogues. So there's tons and tons and tons of scripts and dialogues. Another great resource for scripts and dialogues is YouTube. You know, if you go on YouTube and you just type F FISBO, FB, S, FSBO scripts and dialogues, um, or you can type FISBO live calls. There's tons of people online that are, you know, you can watch them make live calls. Um, so let's talk about for sale by owner. A for, a for sale by owner person is someone that thinks there's nothing to it. <laughs> they can sell the house. They're, it's easy peasy. Buyer's going to come in, make an offer, and they can save the commission, right? So there's a, there's a lot of dialogue that you can be prepared for with a for sale by owner. Um, I would say if you're initially calling a for sale by owner, uh, whenever you guys see a sign in someone's lawn and it's not an agent sign and it says a, it has a phone number for sale, immediately pull over, call the number. So I would say, hi, this is JJ Wallach, Keller Williams, Beverly Hills. Um, I'm in front of your house at such and such address. Um, can I come in and see it? They're going to be like, do you have a buyer? 
I was like, probably, let, let me see the house. So my, my whole job is to come in and see the house. Now, um, when I come in, I'm going to be asking questions to the seller. Uh, the seller the seller just wants to know if I have a buyer. So my, my, my strategy now with the seller is, um, I might have a buyer. Do you think that's the way that you're going to get the most money? Right. And I'm, I'm going to be all about um, publicity. That's the number one thing for any seller. But no matter what the listing appointment is that I'm on, um, my value that I'm expressing to the seller is that I can get the most eyeballs on their property. Every buyer in the market will know those properties for sale. That's my value. And, they and then I'm going to get, how do I do that? Now, a for sale by owner is someone that has a sign in the front lawn. So right now, the only people that are aware of that property for sale are people that are driving up and down that street. That's a very, very limited pool of people. Um, if I want to move to, say, Austin, Texas, what am I going to, I'm not driving ever, up and down every street in Austin, right? I'm calling an agent in Austin. So in order for an agent to know about a property for sale, it has to go on the MLS, right? So now the for sale by owner might tell you, well, I'm listing my property on Zillow. Okay, great. You're listing your property on Zillow. I, I as an agent, do not research Zillow to find properties. If, if someone is calling me to move to LA, I'm going on the MLS. I'm, I'm not going on Zillow. <laughs> So you're not you're not reaching everybody, you know. Plus, don't forget, in Keller Williams, at, what's our value proposition with Keller Williams? We're the largest brokerage in the world by agent count. Um, you know, there's I think it's like 600 agents in this office, 700 agents in this office. So just our office is a ton of people. Uh, we have access to so many people. And don't forget, we have something called KW Alerts. You know, we can immediately send out an email blast to 3,000 agents. Um, so the strategy with a for sale by owner is I'm going in there with a list of presentation. I'm also going in there with my KW checklist. Don't forget, we have a whole checklist of three pages of forms that are needed, right? So I'm going to ask them, who's doing all your paperwork for you, right? Who's, do, who's doing it? They might say an attorney. Okay, great. Does that, an attorney is not someone who does real estate every day. You might have a real estate attorney but they're not in the trenches every day selling real estate. Like they don't know the ins and outs and the dialogue they have. They're not coming here to meet the appraiser, to meet the other agent, going to be present at inspections. An attorney is just going to sit at their desk and do paperwork, right? So that's not going to help you in all your negotiations. And the attorneys are usually way too tough with people. They might kill your deal. Like that's not who I want representing me. Um, if they say, well, I think I, I, I can do it. I can do it myself. Okay. Do you do your taxes yourself? You hire, most people will hire an accountant, right? Um, you know, what, what other professionals, you know, would you hire, hire, hire an accountant to do my taxes? Um, there's one other professional was thinking, like, you know, pe most people will hire an agent. Now, banks used to sell properties directly for their homes that were in default. When a bank, banks used to, when people would stop paying, they would foreclose you could go directly to a bank, to the asset manager, and buy properties directly from a bank. You can't do that anymore. Banks list properties now with agents. Okay, there's a reason for that. Because the whoever's the asset manager at the bank, they have to answer to the board of directors. And they don't, want, they don't want preferential treatment. You know, how do they know the asset manager isn't telling their nephew, you know, I'll sell you this property cheap, right? So they have to list the property. Banks list properties. And that's how they know that they're going to get the most money. It gets publicized. Um, back when we had short sales, right? That was a big thing, short sales. Um, the banks would make sure they had two Sunday open houses. They want to make sure that the property is fully publicized to the public before they accept an offer. Okay, interest rates. Let's talk about interest rates. Um, you're talking to a seller and they say, I don't want to sell because... I have this great interest rate, and if I buy something else, my interest rate is going to go up now, seven, seven and a quarter, seven and a half. Um, now, if we're talking about someone's primary residence, where they live, I, I don't consider, my, my conversation with that person is, I don't consider that as an investment. This is where you live. So 
if you are going to go to a bigger house or to a smaller house, um, it really doesn't matter where you are buying. Prices may be high, interest rates may be high, prices may be low, interest rates may be low. Where Wherever price you're selling at, wherever the market is, if the prices are high, you're selling high and you're buying high. If the prices drop, you're selling low and buying low, right? This is your primary residence. Now, if you, if you find a property that you love, you should buy it because you don't want to wait for interest rates to go down and then you start your property search because you're going to miss the property that you love. If you love a property, buy it. If interest rates go down, you'll refinance. If interest rates continue to go up, you'll be happy that you got it for the interest rate that you did. But if you love the property, buy it, right? Is that a good dialogue for, for, for interest rates, right? Now, if investors, it's interesting. I'm talking to a lot of investors right now, and um, that doesn't stop investors from buying. The investors buy. You know, if, if the numbers crunch and they, they make sense, investors will buy. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday or the day before, uh, and they were saying that they were looking at something and, and talking to a lender. I said, how many years are you guaranteed your rate for? And I was like, are you getting five years, seven years? They're like, no, three. I was like, whoa, you're a gambler, like three years. But they they don't, you know, whatever. I mean, investors um, investors just want to buy deals that make sense. That's, that's it. So if the numbers make sense, they'll buy. So interest rates are not really an issue for investors. I mean, they, they because of the numbers, what I'm saying is the numbers have to make sense. So also when you're talking to your buyers about, about their residences, there's what we call an interest rate buy down. So it's very common right now that sellers will give a credit to lower the interest rate on the loan. And there's like three, two, one buy downs, which means uh, the first three years will have, the payment will be just as if the, the rate was much lower. And this is going on very common right now. Uh, they're called interest rate buy down. Discount JJ, commission. JJ. Will you lower your price? <laughs> JJ. Um, you know, commission dialogue is something every agent really has to own. We, we need to be professionals at the scripts and dialogues regarding commissions. And now, especially, um, we, we need to because of the recent NAR settlement and what's going on. So agents used to try to avoid the commission dialogue altogether. Just don't even want to talk about it. Um, now, our California contracts, the listing agreement, the buyer agreement, they've always said in bold type, always, commissions are negotiable. Our California contracts are awesome. They've always been awesome. They say commissions are negotiable. Here's the total amount we're charging. And here's what we're offering to a cooperating broker. So our California contracts have always said this. Um, these lawsuits started in Missouri where sellers were signing listing agreements with a total commission. And that was it. Like this, the, the list, the seller did not know what was being offered to buyer's agents. Um, there was a lawsuit about collusion for interest rate, for commission rates. Um, anyways, they settled this loss just to stop it in its tracks. Um, now, a lot of sellers out there don't know what actually happened or what this lawsuit is about. They know because all the, all the clickbait that's been in the media is, you know, this is the end of commissions, cheaper commissions, but like that's all, that's all clickbait. But when you talk to us, I, I, was, I was on a listing appointment two weeks ago with an attorney in his office. And he said to me, what's going on with commissions? I said, you have to pay them. <laughs> well, there's nothing going on. So the, the buyer's side commission is advertised as an incentive for agents to bring their buyers, right? Do you want other agents to bring buyers to your property? Of course you do, right? There's no, there's no question. This is the, the commission that you're offering to buyer's agents is your marketing, it's part of your marketing thread. It's how we get buyers to your property. What's the point? The, the, the whole point of everything. So the, what's the point of them saying the wording that they know is not true? Is it hopeful thinking that we're going to get rid of commissions? No, no. I think right, the, the entire, right. The entire point of everything was uh, transparency. 
transparency. No, so, but, but why would a paper write something that they know oh, truthfully isn't totally real? The commissions have gone away. Total clickbait. But when you say clickbait, what does that mean? It means they want you to click on the article headline and then read the article. They're just trying to get the clicks because that's how they sell advertising. Advertising is sold. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Sorry. I did right. I mean, adver advertising is sold based on how they guess. They say to their advertisers, we're getting 80,000 yeah. views on exactly. that. You pay us 7,000. That's it. That's what it comes That's, to. Okay. Have you ever gotten a news like notification and it'll have one title? And then when you click on the article, I try not to do that. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get to the truth. Whoa. You don't get to the truth until paragraph three. Okay. All right. Nothing really changed. Nothing changed. No, here's, here's what changed. Mm -hmm. Two things changed. The MLS will no longer advertise commissions. Everyone else can accept the MLS. That's one thing that changed. The other thing that changed is before a buyer walks into a property, they need to sign a buyer representation agreement. Those are the two things that change. And that is hopeful thinking because they're assuming that the agent will explain to them what that contract means. Right. So okay. This is part of the transparency issue where sellers and buyers were not Agents were not having the commission dialogue. They were not having the commission dialogue. Now they're for, forced to have the commission dialogue. So if I'm sitting with a piece of paper and I'm asking someone to sign it and it's regarding commissions, my dialogue is commissions are negotiable. They've always been, they've always been, commissions are negotiable. They've always been negotiable. Now you want to break down the commission between the listing side and the buying side, right? Because the seller thinks that you're getting all this commission up front, right? So if, if I, I used to sit with a seller and I would have 6% 6 pre-filled in my listing contract because I can always negotiate down. I can't negotiate up, right? So I can have 6% pre-filled in, cross it out, put a five. That's easy to go, but I can't have a five, cross it out, put six, right? Um, so start high, it's negotiable. So if we're negotiating, we're negotiating. So... Uh, if they say, okay, uh, can I offer less? We'll say, well, you can, right? You can pay less commission, but here's what's going to happen. If there are other properties offering a higher commission, a lot of agents are going to show your property last. They're going to try to sell the ones that they're getting the most money first. Right? That's just how it is. It's life. That's life. Agents are very motivated by money. But you can say that to them. Of course, it's it's real life. Because this is this is a this is a dialogue of how they're going to get the most offers on their property. So the way that they're going to get offers is more buyers coming. How are they going to get more buyers coming? Incentivize agents to bring them. So we we see um, advertising sometimes. It'll say, you know, extra one percent commission if accepted offer before the end of the month. Like we, that's an incentive for people to bring their buyers in. Right? Sometimes you'll see 6%, 7% commissions being advertised just on the buyer side to help get buyers in. So if, if offer is accepted before such and such a date, um, it's a, usually from a developer. It could be anybody. It could be anybody. I, I've seen I've seen agents on regular homes. Like the, if the seller needs to sell and the seller is saying to the agent, you know, how do we get buyers in here? You can reduce your price or you can try to, offer an incentive to agents to bring their buyers, right? And the commission is tax deductible. The commission is tax deductible, yeah. It's a sale. Yeah, it's a profit sale. So they're going to net less, so they'll pay commission on less. They'll pay uh, taxes on less. Yeah. yeah. I witnessed a great conversation yesterday with Andrew Bloom, who the, the, the seller wanted more money. We had the conversation of capital gains. Yes. Like, okay, that extra 300 grand, grand that capital gains, you're going to pay on that? May or may not work oh. out for you, and then guess what? We they decided that that wasn't in their best interest. Were they you know, were they moving up into a new tax bracket? But, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. That's, so that's well, it was inheritance. It's, it's, the house was given to them as an inheritance. Okay. And then now they're saying well, we want to sell it for this amount, and Andrew's like, you might want to save down here because that extra three hundred grand, you're just going to pay it all in taxes. Yeah. Oh. Right. Right. And I didn't know that, and then guess what? The, Client said, "You're right. Let's just sell it at this, and I'll keep that, and you're actually further ahead." Okay, pretty powerful. That's good stuff. But you got to know tax stuff. I know tax stuff. Tax. Um, more, more commission dialogue. So, someone says to you, "If you also represent the buyer, 
how, like, how does that work? Like, isn't there a conflict of interest? Right. So there, when you're starting to, to sign a listing, you're going to be going through these documents. So you have an agency. You have to explain what agency is. There's agents that represent buyers. There's agents that represent sellers. And there's agents that represent both buyers and sellers. So we're talking about our broker. We represent everybody at the same time. And then there's another form called possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. What happens if we have a listing, a buyer walks in who's not represented by a buyer, who's not represented by an agent, and they want us to write the offer? Right now, what the, the seller might say to you, this is a conflict of interest. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with you writing an offer for a buyer. Right. If you're representing me, who are you representing? So the dialogue in that case is my job to you for you. My job, my duty to you is the seller is to get you the most money. That's always my job. You, you are my client and I'm here to get you the most money. If somebody walks in without an agent, I will facilitate the transaction by writing their offer. And my only duty to them is fair and honest dealing and full disclosure. I can't lie to them. And I have to disclose what I know about the property. So that's it. My, my duty to you is to get you the most money. And my duty to them is full disclosure. Um, it's best for you as the seller. If I, if, if I'm, it's best for you if I'm the one facilitating that deal, why we're not there, we're not playing uh, operator, right? There's no, there's no message getting clouded in the middle, right? I'm direct to the buyer, direct to you. I'll make this deal happen, right? Nothing's getting muddled. There's no miscommunication anywhere, right? This is, that's the best case scenario for you. Now, if they say, well, will you do it for less? Now that's a business decision for you. I would say, um, uh, I want to work just as I'm going to be working the hardest to bring a buyer for you. That's the, right. So my job as the listing agent is to get you the most money is to, it's to properly advertise your party property to get people through the door. Right? I'm going to do that with my photography, my advertising, my emails, social media, right. Whatever, whatever you're doing and showing uh, how you're, how you're getting people there. But I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm going to be working on bringing my own buyers too. You know, shouldn't I have just as fair a chance of earning that commission as any other buyer's agent? Okay. So you can you can have that. Do you want to penalize me if I'm if I'm the one that has the buyer willing to pay the most? Do you want to penalize me for that? Now, of course, you know you can you can offer a discounted commission if you're representing both sides. You know I, that's the last case scenario. If that's if you think that that's the that's going to make or break you getting a listing, yeah, for sure. We want in the business, you know, but. Um, if you do that, then I would say make sure that you just have a clause in the listing contract. And we'll talk about this when we go over listing contracts. Make sure you have a clause there that you'll reduce it um, if you yourself, so you put your own name, if you yourself also represent a buyer in a non-multiple offer transaction. So if there's multiple offers, we don't want to create an unfair situation where the seller is paying less for your buyer at the same price offer as another agent's buyer. So if you have a buyer for a million and another agent has a buyer for a million and the seller is paying less for your buyer as a discount commission, that's an unfair advantage. So I would just put it in the, in the verbiage in a non-multiple offer transaction. So the non-multiple offer means that they would have to work with you? or would... Non-multiple offer means if there are several offers at the same time on the property, you'll get a full commission if your buyer is the winner. Oh, just the incident commission dialogue. And the 6% commission, is that if you are uh, if you find a buyer and a seller or or just one? So 6% commission used to be what we call a standard commission. I'm, you know, now with this new situation, I'm afraid to use the word standard anymore. So I would just talk about commissions in general. Commissions are negotiable. There are, there are people that are offering six. There are agents that will take seven. They take 7% listings. Um, Even if you do just represent just the buyer or just the seller? So so you, what usually happens is um, the seller is agreeing to a, a full commission, either 6% or 5% or 5.5%, whatever that commission is. That's the total commission they will pay when they sell. And then further down in the, in the listing agreement, it says, this is how much we, plus the listing broker, will offer cooperating brokers that bring buyers. So that's usually how. But you can sign. You can sign a. 
you can sign a five and a half percent listing, say, and take 3% for the listing side and, two and, and offer two and a half to the buyer side. Now, I will always make an argument to a seller that the buying side commission is the most critical. It's even more important than my listing side because I want to give the property every opportunity to get most buyers possible. So I'm not even going to let them negotiate. I mean, I mean, it's negotiable, but I'm trying really hard to not let them negotiate buyer side commission. That is two and I want to advertise two and a half percent. I don't want to be the person advertising two when everyone else is advertising two and a half. It's, I'm, why, why would we hurt ourselves? It's such a small amount of money. We're talking about a big picture of 100%, and we're talking about a half a percent. Like I, It's not even, right? I mean, it's just silly. Every seller should want to try to get the most money they can. And getting the most money they can is having everyone working to bring buyers, right? So I want every agent trying to bring buyers in. Um, commission is an incentive, and it's a marketing strategy. We're, we're just, we're forced to have these dialogue now on commission. We used to be able to skirt past this and just, you know, hopefully they don't bring it up. Hopefully they don't bring it up. Now, because of the new uh, settlement and the NAR stuff, sellers are probably going to bring this up and we just need to be prepared to talk about it. So, uh, but, but it's, it's good. It's good that we're having this conversation. And that was, I think that was part of the point was in other states, these conversations were never happening and now they are happening. Um, can I, may I yeah, please. Do, you, do you foresee uh, um, some people who are going to say, no, no, I mean, let the buyers pay for the buyer's commission. So there will so always have to do. Yeah. And there's always going to be people that want to push back. Always. So you just stick with the, well, we want more eyes on it. We want to appeal to the buyer's agents and have them bring their clients. Yes. I mean, we need to, we need to show the value of why offering a commission works. <laughs> right. So. I mean, if, if sellers don't want to offer a commission at all to the buyer side, okay, so let's have that, let's have that discussion. Okay, so we are going on the market and we're not offering a commission. Do, will any agent bring their buyer here? Right. <laughs> well, I mean, from the buyer agent perspective, there, there are going to be contracts now, right? And it's going to be preordained. Right, so let's talk about this. Rates are... So, how many buyers are willing to pay the commission on top of their purchase price? Yeah. From up front, like right. How many buyers are there that are going to be willing to do that? We're just narrowing our buyer pool, exactly. right? It's like it's like if I list a home that's um, that's uh, historical, right? I've li I've limited my buyer pool to only owner users that want a historical property. The developers are not buying. Uh, a property that's historic because they can't touch it. They can't do anything with it. It's always going to look the same from the street. Maybe they can add a second story in the back where no one can see it, but that's about the size of it. Like, so we don't want to limit our buyer pool. We want to grow our buyer pool. If you're, if you're not offering a commission, you're immediately canceling out all the buyers that don't can't afford to pay a buyer's commission. They could afford it if that money was rolled into their loan, right? But they can't afford it on top of their down payment Right, so that that's a that's a conversation we're definitely going to have for people that are really pushing back on on not offering. When I see a discounted commission in the MLS or anywhere advertised a discounted commission, the first thing that I personally think about is the listing agent did not have good scripts and dialogues with the seller. That that agent did their seller a disservice by you offering a discount commission because you know shouldn't everyone be when I when I go in the MLS now and I see a commission advertised. And it says two and a half. I'm like, <laughs> and, and I, I just, you know, you just move on. I'm like, okay, good. When I see two, I'm thinking to myself, huh? unless it's a 10 million or more property. Um, but even though I, I see properties in Beverly Hills that are 10 million or higher offering 3%. Lee Ziff, uh, he's all about a 6%, 6% listing. So I'm not sure if he always offers three. He might, he might take a 6% listing and offer two and a half and keep the extra money for advertising. So that's my question because I've witnessed that too. Yeah. Um, I I feel bad about that where where we sell the seller on six percent and then turn around and only give two and a half to the buyers. So if you are a heavy marketer, it's part of your cost, right? You can justify why you're doing that. I don't think that's 
Oh, no, of course, of course. Well, but the hard part. see where I'm from, it's three percent on every buy side. There is no such thing as two. They don't even come to your house. Two and a half percent. They'll be like, you're the loser at two and a half percent. Nothing is changing here. Okay. Because age, we all need agents to sell properties. Yes. It does nothing's changing. The only thing that's changing is the commissions won't be advertised in the MLS. Can I just remind everybody yeah. that uh, NAR is offering a free ADR course, monthly three hundred dollars till the end of the year. So if you want to get your script and dialogue better as a buyer's agent, excellent. Go take the ADR course free. For free. Where do you get it? A free course NAR. from NAR, not CAR. Uh, to get certified, though, you have to do five transactions before you can actually carry the ADR designation. So it's about an NAR and an S from there. So again, about an NAR and S for what? Just go to NAR's visited buyer's representative, ABR. ABR, accredited buyer. Normally $295, and you have to have five transactions to list it as an ABR designated agent. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's just getting the script of dialogues of the course will change yes. your ability. Well, I wanted to show everyone there's a book here called Exactly What to Say for Real Estate Agents. Um, exactly What to Say. So, this, you know, everyone has different scripts and dialogues. There's tons. Go on YouTube. Go on my shared folder in the scripts and dialogues folder. Um, go on command. So when you log into command for Keller Williams, you go to agent.kw.com. And then in the upper left-hand corner, there's a button to press on for connect. Connect is all our education. And you can see agents doing by calls, just like on YouTube, but agents in KW. This is this is a book exactly what to say for real estate agents. One of the many scripts and Okay, door knocking. Uh, so people say, when is the best time to door knock? Should I go in the morning? Should I go in the afternoon? So the answer to what time should I go door knocking is any time or any time that works for you. Now, when you go at a certain time, usually there are certain people that will be home at that time, right? If you go at a different time, other people will be home at that time. Everyone has different schedules, right? So there's no best time. The best time is, the best time is, Mix it up, right? Because different people will be home at different times. Um, what is someone at the door going to say? They're going to say to you, I'm never selling. They're going to take me out of here in a box. All right, I'm dying here. Like, I'm never leaving. <laughs> so they could say that. Great, fine. Okay. But you know what? You could you could say, okay, that's amazing. And you walk down the street and their phone rings and it's their boss saying, we're relocating you to St. Louis. Now, that person that just said they're never leaving just got relocated. Life change, there's always change, everything's changing, change. Change is what drives the world, nothing's static. So we need to just continue to knock on those person's door and have fun with them. If they, if they tell you, you know, I'm gonna die here, say, okay, well, can you put me in your will as the real estate agent? <laughs> and then no one has to fight over who the agent's gonna be. <laughs> just have fun with that. You're, you're making a relationship with these people. Um, ask them if they know anyone else in the neighborhood that's been talking about moving. That's it. You're, everything is about relationship. You're going to knock the door again, knock the door again, knock the door again. When you have an open house in the area, they're going to see your sign. They're going to come in. You're going to say, hey, how you doing? I know you're never moving. I know. Come look around. Um, but, you know, that's it. You're infiltrating an area and taking it over. So, so you're going to know everyone in the neighborhood. You're going to have your signs out. They're going to come in your open house. You're saying hello to everybody. You're knocking on the doors. You're saying them just listed, just sold postcards. You know, that's how you take over the areas. Uh, is there a consistency to that? Everything is about consistency. Yeah. I'm just saying, once a month, too much? So, okay, so what Gary Keller says is, first, first, pick a streak. Know every person on that street and get familiar with everything on that street. Once, you're, once you've done that, add a street, add a street, until you have 500 homes. Once you have 500 homes, you should be knocking 25 homes a day, five days a week. So that's two hours. It's basically two hours a day, five days a week. We'll get you 125 a week. It's 500 a month. So every month you're knocking the same door. So that's you if you're 500, how many are supposed to sell? Two? Uh, out of 500, you should have you should have um, a 3%, 3% per year. So out of 500, you should have 15 sales a year. Oh, oh. But it's not just that. When you take a listing, you're leveraging your listing. When you have a listing, buyers are coming in. So that one listing, you can get 
another listing from a neighbor. So I every every open house is a dress rehearsal. Like this is how I conduct myself in my open house. This is what I have that I'm handing out. Talk. So neighbors are coming in. Uh, that those neighbors are potential listings, and then you're meeting buyers. So all these buyers, you know, they they can only sell this house once. But you know, you're you're talking to each buyer. What are you looking for? Have you talked to a lender yet? Right. So every one of those buyers, you can convert. Hopefully, and that's that's our job. Scripts um, and dialogue. So the the whole idea is to keep keep improving our scripts and dialogues to lower our contact ratio. That we need to talk to less people to get an appointment. That's the whole idea. So we want to go on listing appointments. We want to get buyers. Um, your personal income is going to be based upon how many people you talk to every day. That's all That's all it comes down to. So the difference between selling five homes a year or 500 homes a year is just about how many people you're talking to. That's all it comes down to. So it's up to you. You know, now, now you have to make a plan. You know, the first, Gary Keller wrote a book called The One Things. And he said the, every agent's one thing before any other thing is to first figure out what they're going to do for prospecting. What are you going to do for your daily prospecting? There's nothing else to think about until you decide what you're going to do for your daily prospecting. You have to have a daily something that you do every single day. It's a non-negotiable. This is what I'm going to do every day to, re to reach who you're going to reach. Are you going to reach your geographic area? Are you going to go after for sale by owners? Are you going to go after expired listings? Uh, people that are in default. Right, so the bankruptcy, divorces, people that have babies, they need, you know, they're outgrowing the property. Like, you just have to think, what, what is going to be your daily lead generation? Your daily lead generation might be just handing out cards. You know, some agents put a pack of ten business cards in their pocket every day, every morning, and they know that by the end of the day, those have to be handed out. That's that's their lead gen. Some, and you can be a very successful agent going bar hopping Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that's that's your thing. Just talking to people. With, Except for Richard. Well, I put the sludge bucket, but I eat food there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your your total lead gen can just be going out partying and talking to people and, and asking them, do you have any plans this year in real estate? That's it. And then how do you and, build trust with them? Because uh, obviously uh, like a stranger is gonna be uh, more uh, no, you're I mean you're a professional person. I mean, yeah, you're build you're building trust yeah. just uh, by talking to them. Just and but you can build trust by by knowing area statistics. So like I just said at the beginning of this class, I said there were seven sales. There were seven sales in Beverly Hills in March, seven single family. The lowest price was $3 million, Second lowest was $5 million, Third lowest was $7 million. Yeah. Just for me telling you those stats, you know, I, uh, I know something about Beverly Hills, right? So I, I immediately credit, accredited myself by telling you those stats, right? So you instant trust. Like, yeah. I know Beverly Hills. Yeah. I'm just going to share another underserviced way to get listings is go to all the top hotels in your area and talk to the concierge down in the lobby and register with them as a really cool local real estate agent who can help you with because people come down to that concierge desk and say, hey, what what home should we go see around the hotel? Yes, because it turns out 60 percent of people while traveling actually do something to look at local real estate to say oh, by the way maybe we should move here or what is what makes this great place great it would be great to make friends with hotel concierge people yeah. and also doormen yeah doormen buildings the doormen and buildings they know everything going on in the building right they know maybe like <laughs> those are, but those are great yeah. people those are so that's what we call it's an underserviced market too. Trust me, realtors. Yeah. The other thing I'll tell you is go over here to the Four Seasons Bar every night and sit there for an hour. There'll be one businessman in town for me. <laughs> and there's so there's so many investors. So, so every every conversation you have with an investor, what do I need to show you today for you to write a check today? Every investor is going to say, "Bring me a deal, bring me a deal, bring me a deal." What do I need to show you today that you would write a check for today? That's the question, All right? That's a good one. Right down to it. What do I need to show you today that you write a check for? And I'll find it. All right, guys. All right. We're going to take a six, seven minute break and then we'll start a class.
The 11 o'clock class is going to be on residential leases after sale. Leasebacks. Leasebacks. So a seller staying in the house past the close of escrow. That's what we're going to talk about. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please pin your topic for today on the chat? It's coming to you on Zoom. Oh, they are. Okay. Let's address those people. Oh, Oh, yeah, every day. Almost. 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 Almost.